move on to our third president, Marco Bischoff, who was supposed to be here to talk with us, and as I mentioned, he cannot now. Um, Rolf, you're going to yes. introduce him to us. I'm lucky I uh, know him personally, and uh, uh, I know he is uh, giving a lot of lectures both in Germany and other countries. And uh, I know he is a uh, president of uh, biophysics in Germany, Institute of Biophysics. And he is uh, the director of future science and medicine in Germany. And uh, to me he is uh, one of the most brilliant uh, human beings I ever met. So, uh, and I wish he could be here, but for healthy reasons, as we all know, he could. Yes. And uh, he has written a lot of books. Uh, I will mention one of them. Uh, the book about uh, biophoton is a very comprehensive book about research on biophotons. So, uh, well, that's what I had to say. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, because he couldn't come, we thought um, we could at least have a piece of him through a recording, a video. And we, uh, Larry had found a recording of a lecture Marco gave in 2003, which is the year of the birth of the ILA. So we felt it would be appropriate. That was at the Syntonics conference. And um, it's surprising, actually, this, this lecture was given 10 years ago, but it is still very, very... Um, relevant today and uh, it's it's about an hour and a half long so we certainly will not go through the whole thing but uh, i've just taken some excerpts for about 20 minutes at the beginning of the lecture and the very end the question period which i felt was the more lively and where we get the best feeling of uh, marco
was not only used for what we, uh, for what is now uh, electromagnetic fields, but it was used for fields in a more general sense. And it was also not only used for physical fields, but also for what today, uh, in, uh, uh, from the same point of science, we would call non-physical fields, non-electromagnetic fields, an unknown type of fields which physics is only starting to go into now. Next, please. In the new kind of approach that I am representing in biophysics, but also other disciplines like biology, power psychology, consciousness research, complementary medicine, and so on, science has started to reconsider the possibility that, like it was in the beginning of history, that there are two kinds of light, not only physical light in the sense of electromagnetic fields, but or outer light, as I call it here, uh, but also inner light, in the sense of non-electromagnetic fields, which can be on the one hand still physical, although non-electromagnetic, and on the other hand fields that are even non-physical, in the sense of today's physics. Next, please. Now, a uh, little bit to the actuality of the topic of light, because it's very interesting how in the last few years, a light has become a, a very hot topic. Uh, and um, in, in very many different uh, fields, it has become a hot topic. For instance, there was uh, Hazel Anderson, she's kind of an economist or futurist. Um, she has written uh, several books with the top on the topic of the age of light. She says, we are now entering into the age of light and the use of solar energy is only part of what she means. And then we also have now many technologies based on light, for instance, photonic computers. Computers that are not based on electrons anymore, but on photons. Also in art, we have now uh, lots of artists uh, working with light and they, some of them call it photonic art. And what is very important in many of these fields is that recently, very recently, that means in the last 10 years only, there have been in quantum optics several new fields uh, coming up which have discovered uh, revolutionary properties of light. Uh, I will shortly talk about this a bit more. And one of these new fields is the field that I, uh, that we in our institute work uh, upon, uh, that is biophoton research, belonging to the uh, discipline of optical biophysics. That means measuring a very weak light that is emitted by all living organisms, including man. And lastly, uh, uh, there are also a number of books uh, that have recently been published with the topic of light, and of course, you know the first one, because I think uh, its author has been speaking uh, in the college, uh, uh, the book uh, Catching the Light by author Sergeant, Sergeant, I think, or Science, Science. And uh, David Allen Park's uh, book, The Fire Within the Eye, is another example. So, such a synthesis of inner and outer light, which brings together these long separated ways of science on the one hand, and of poetry, art, mysticism, and philosophy on the other hand, corresponds, as I think, to a deep-seated need of our time. That's why Many people are so excited by these ideas. And it constitutes one of the main attractions of these physical models that I have described, that, and also others, that unite physics and consciousness, the inner and the outer. Next. However, to really fulfill this need fully, I think we need to go a bit further than, than that. We need a comprehensive, holistic concept of reality, and therefore uh, I propose that we uh, complement and deepen these physical models with the help of certain traditional concepts, especially the so-called uh, 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 concept of the 
three worlds. In this, in this concept, there is a like imaginative ground of being, this, this uh, Ulus Mundus level of reality, where inner and outer light are still united. Um, can be connected with what uh, in alchemy was called God's imagination. Sometimes uh, it is also in some, some traditions it is called the mission power. And uh, by this uh, we mean the, the creative and formative activity of this ground of being. Uh, which, uh, according to Carl Gustav Jung, is a force able to affect changes as well in the psyche as in matter. In the concept of the three worlds that I have done a lot of research about, that we find in various cultures, the imagination is considered to be a creative force in, in which we all partake. That means we are co-creators of an ongoing creative process. The world is not thing, has not been created sometime in the beginning and since then is, is as it is, but creation is going on all the time and we are taking part in this process as co-creators. And how are we taking part? By the imagination. That means we take part in God's reality creating activity by our mainly unconscious processes but of course it would be better if we do, did it consciously. That means as a consequence if we accept this worldview we incur a new kind of responsibility because now it is not only the material reality that we affect with our actions, as our law says, you know, we are only responsible for our actions. We cannot be uh, put uh, into prison uh, because we intended to do something. Okay, but here, if you take this seriously, it means that also, not only our actions, but also our thoughts, our imaginations, our feelings, our emotions impress themselves upon the ether. And in this way, sub subtly influence also the life of others and of the environment. And that means it's not a private thing anymore. Next one. If you're willing to accept that. Yeah, I, I say, if we accept this concept, then we have to take this consequence. So, I come to my last uh, chapter, the cultivation of the inner light. This means, if we really accept this and take this responsibility, we have to think about how to consciously deal with this, instead of unconsciously. Because we always have this influence, if we want or not, but to take responsibility means first to become conscious of this process and then, uh, of course, to uh, behave accordingly. So we need to learn how to deal correctly with the inner light of imagination. And this is what is called by the Chinese the cultivating the cultivation of the inner light. This entails first that we have to recognize the luminosity of everything that is alive at least. And then we have to train our perception for it, for this luminosity. Next one. The philosopher Feldstein said, man is a luminator because of his continuous expression of the latent spiritual potential in the realm of the physically visible. That means if we express our inner nature in the outward world, we are luminators. So, for, for instance, the perception of a human face in the state of joy, happiness, or relief, these are examples now, 
for the luminous nature, luminous phenomena. The changed atmosphere in a room where a solution for a problem has just been found. The special energy field that exists between two people that are in love. The almost imperceptible glow of a newborn child or of fresh plant shoots or leaves. Or conversely, the subtle darkening and thickening of the atmosphere during unsolved conflicts in a group of people. The atmosphere of fear, depression and so on. All these are examples of this subtle luminosity that we can perceive. Next one. So for per perceiving this luminosity, we need uh, to train a new kind of a feeling sight as it was proposed by instance by Jacob Lieberman or by others like George Pennington and Ladmay and, and so on. The luminosity of the spiritual higher light behind the physical light is perceptible as a subjective spiritual quality of our own body awareness and of the atmosphere around us and between us and other people. And therefore, and, and it requires a, a special kind of seeing with our whole existence. Of course, you know a lot about this, because it's related to what you are talking about. And therefore, um, it requires a training of body awareness, you know, I'm, I'm also a body therapist, a breathing therapist, and so uh, I'm speaking from this type of experience, but you, I'm sure, could uh, speak as uh, optometrists and, and uh, symptomic therapists. And uh, training of the field-like perception of ourselves. Next one. Well, that was it. I think um, it was probably enough because um, the manuscript that this is based upon uh, goes much more in detail into detail in, in all these questions uh, but um, I think this was um, maybe uh, um, enough of an overview to show this, um, this other aspect of light uh, that is um, that has always been existing in the history, but also at the same time is now uh, being recognized again by modern science. Thank you. First of all, science is not a monolithic thing, you know? Not all scientists think the same way about the same things. There are very many different schools. And the main thing where they differ is, of course, the interpretation of scientific results. And the interpretation depends on your philosophical background that you have, which in scientists usually is unconscious, but it is, it is there, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I only can say that at this moment there is a very strong change going on in science. It is not very visible really. Some, sometimes you see certain books that are published, certain suits that are set by scientists. Um, but it is by no means so that you can say that what I told here is uh, uh, that scientists will be will agree to this. Not at all. Most of them will get furious uh, if they hear such a thing. Uh, uh, others will say, "Oh, in public, I don't say anything about it." But privately, uh, I have had this, uh, similar thoughts, you know. But only I cannot tell when my boss is around <laughs> because I will lose my my. Uh, Putability as a scientist, you know, talking about these kind of things. The only, the only question that I have really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I, I think I know, I would come to this, you know. Um, 
actually the, the results of such experiments like in CERN also, particle physics especially you mean, um, <clears throat> do not exclude what I say here. Yeah, but, but many scientists would say, no, 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 you cannot interpret it like this. And others would say, yes, of course, it's open, you know, we can also interpret it this way. Well, um, you know, it's my right. You know, one, I think one thing is important uh, for science now to be able to make real progress. And that is that scientists accept that to really get an understanding of reality, they have to include elements into their thinking that cannot be proved right now. Because if, if you don't do this, you will never be able to arrive at any understanding. But this is already something very difficult for most scientists. Because they, many of them would say, uh, we can only consider elements in our theories or in our discussions which are really proven. Uh, everything else, no. They don't understand their paradigm. But like this, like this, um, real understanding will never be arrived at. Yes, please. Yeah, I was hoping to talk about training or biophotons. What is the difference that some people have where they are able to see or is it others or not? Yeah, what that one does. I don't know. I just can tell you. I cannot see auras at all. But I am sure this is just because I'm not the visual type. What I can do very well is feel auras. But I don't see any colors ever. I also am not able to visualize colors, for instance. But I am very good in sensing you know, I can sense all kinds of things from people immediately, but I cannot see anything. So, auras are not only about colors and seeing something. Yeah, or skills. Mm. Mark, I think you have to have Excuse me, how much time is left for discussion? Not in no time. <laughs> Well, I thank you very much for listening, and well, maybe one one more question. One one more question. The lady, the lady has one more question. <laughs> this field of potential information, um, how to stimulate it? What? Am I, tell me if I'm wrong. Right? We we had two sources, two things here: the inner light, or you know, the physical light, as you want to call it. But yet they're both connected. But it seems like that's what what you're stimulating that field of potential information is how we interact, or what can stimulate that. Well, first of all, I have to say, you know, what is fundamental for understanding this is that what science does, first of all, is to reduce any phenomena down to something that can be measured and that is defined scientifically. So that means any scientific concept like light or field is always only part of the phenomenon. And so what, I, what I've been telling you is that it's like an iceberg. You know, when we talk about light, when we talk about electromagnetic fields, we only talk about that little part above, above the water that can be measured, that is visible or, or, or can be measured somehow. But the same phenomenon has uh, an invisible part. And uh, to the other part of your question, between humans, there are lots of fields that cannot yet be measured now. Some of them can be measured, there are interesting experiments, but what is very clear is that there is much more than electromagnetic fields between people. 
and, and these things clearly influence us. There are experiments that very clearly show that, for, that there is a connection between people where, uh, for instance, uh, brain waves can be synchronized between people even when they are isolated by Faraday cages. So that means there is something more than electromagnetic fields connecting me with you and everybody. And of course, there is a lot we don't know about this. Thank you.